Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy Teo, Senior Lecturer in Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Courtauld. Um, and I would like to welcome you to this online event in association with LACA, London Asian Contemporary Art. We would like to warmly thank Stephen, uh, Stephen Lowenthal and Lowenthal China Photography Collection for his support of LACA. So I'm really thrilled uh, to be introducing our guest speaker today, uh, the artist and theorist Zheng Guo, currently based in Lantau Island, Hong Kong, who will discuss his practice and thinking on cultivating ecological wisdom in the age of Anthropocene extinction. Zheng Guo has been working in collaboration with plants for more than 10 years, investigating the past and imagining the future from the perspective of marginalized plants and marginalized communities. His range of practice is incredibly diverse and experimental, um, and he has cultivated gardens of weeds and disused urban spaces, grown living plant slogans, led plant tours through the streets of Hong Kong and elsewhere, uh, created eco-queer films and workshops that nurture eco-sensibility and eco-sensitivity. Uh, Bo's works are in the collection of Power Station of Art in Shanghai, Hong Kong Museum of Art, Singapore Art Museum, and Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, among other places. And he has participated in numerous biennials across the world, uh, as well as um, having several solo exhibitions, most recently at the Gorkis Bau in Berlin in 2021. So in addition to being uh, an artist and filmmaker, Bo is also an art historian and educator. He studied with uh, Douglas Crimp and received his PhD from the Graduate Program in Visual and Cultural Studies, University of Rochester, with a brilliant dissertation that focused on socially engaged practice in Greater China. He has also been one of the leading theorists on eco-aesthetics in East Asia um, and uh, taught at the China Academy of Art from 2010 to 2013, and currently teaches at the School of Creative Media City University of Hong Kong, where he leads the Wan Wu Shi practice group. So today, uh, Bo will be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes uh, on his most recent work, including the ongoing project, The Political Life of Plants, and on the concept of uh, Wan Wu, as well as uh, the concept of art as multi-species vibrancy. Following his talk, there will be a Q&A session. So please um, add your questions for Bo to the chat. Um, and at this point, I'm also very pleased to introduce Viv Laws, the head of education at LACA, who will be kicking off the Q&A session later on. Viv is an art historian, curator, author, and journalist who has taught at several, uh, several higher education institutions, including Sotheby's, SOAS, and Imperial College. Since 2011, she has been senior uh, consultant to Singapore Gallery One East Asia and curated many exhibitions on Southeast Asian modern and contemporary art. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to Bo, whose lecture is titled uh, Eco-Sensibility. Uh, whenever you're ready, Bo. Okay. Um, many thanks to Winnie and Viv for this occasion to really, for a dialogue. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about uh, recent works and um, it's, it's really an occasion for me to reflect on what the, these works are about and then to have a conversation with you. Um, before I start, I should say I'm in the village on Lantau Island in Hong Kong and it's um, it's 8 p.m. It's quite dark and because the village is dark, we keep our home uh, dark just to be sim similar to the outside uh, lighting condition. That's why um, uh, that, that, I mean, have a quite dark place. You'll see. Okay. So I'll start the talk so I'll go, I'll go through a few um, projects and um, the, I started to work with plants back in 2013, in the summer of 2013. As Winnie mentioned, I was, before this, I was interested in um, social issues, uh, human issues with communities in Hong Kong, in Beijing, um, et cetera. And in 2013, I moved from Beijing to Hangzhou to Southern China to teach at the uh, China Art Academy. I think that really made me um, get out of the anthropocentric mode because if, you know, I always say I grew up in Beijing, I always say it's, um, 
it's kind of a curse to grow up in Beijing because the city is just saturated with um, human politics. So I, of course, there are, you know, I grew up on in a suburb of Beijing, so there are plants and hills, but I didn't think about them um, when I started to, to, to work as an artist. Only in 2013, after I moved to Southern China, I, I was able to see there are actually beautiful trees in front of the art school. And just at the right time, I was invited to uh, work on a project in Shanghai. This is um, this is an area view of this area in Shanghai called the, the Bund. I'm sure for people who have been to Shanghai recently that you've been to this place. Um, it has been, it has since then has been turned into an art district, the, the major art district in Shanghai. But when I was invited to this place in 2013, um, it wasn't an art district. Um, they were thinking about how to transform this from an industrial place into a post-industrial cultural district. It's along the uh, Huangpu River and the red rectangle that I have circled on the map is this habitat of plants that I encountered in the summer of 2013. I was, I was shocked. I, I was going to this place to, to find a place to show a video work. I was, I was there to look for indoor space. But when I saw this patch of um, plants, I was completely taken away because this is quite central in Shanghai. And I wasn't expecting to see a, a vibrant habitat like this. And the, because for people who know a little bit about this district, you see that the large dome um, um, there, it belongs to the Shanghai cement factory. Which, which was built in the 1910s or 1920s. And it was moved out of the city when Shanghai was preparing for the expo. So the site was industrial and then was vacant from human activity for a few years and plans to go over. And I learned while visiting the site that they were, the organizer was actually thinking about getting rid of the plants to turn this into a cement, a concrete plaza for uh, music concerts for humans. And I was, you know, I, 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 I because I was, I was just so impressed by the plants, I, I thought I had to do something. So I talked to the curator and then she talked to the organizer and uh, I said I, that the plants are part of my art project. And she convinced the organizer to keep the habitat. And I was also, I, I also negotiated with the Adagin sound artist who was organizing the music performance. So I worked with um, local um, landscape designer um, and he worked with people online to identify the plants because the landscape designer actually didn't know these so-called weeds. You know, he's much more knowledgeable of landscaping plants. So we were able to identify um, over 20 different uh, kinds of plants in this um, patch, of, patch of land. And we made signs and I was teaching. So I had um, undergraduate students coming in to make drawings of the, of the plants. And we had an exhibition in a small building on site. So we turned this into what I, what I uh, call a found botanical garden for people in Shanghai to come to see um, local plants or spontaneous plants instead of saying weeds. And I also decided to uh, collaborate with people I know in Shanghai who also teach in different universities like uh, He Xin, who's an ecologist teaching at uh, the, the East China Normal University. And also the third person in this picture, um, Professor Tang Weijie, who's a liter literary scholar who um, did research on plants and um, the 20th century Shanghai, when I asked him to prepare um, a lecture for an open course. So we, uh, eight of us, we made an online open course as part of the project. So we had this uh, found botanical garden and we made an online course as my project to the, uh, to the exhibition. So during the exhibition period for each, week, we will upload a lecture online. Um, and, and then on Sundays, 
we will organize on-site activity for people who are interested to come to, to actually interact with the site. So the lectures um, included ecology, included literary studies, included cultural studies and urban studies and Chinese medicine, etc. So I was thinking how we could talk about plants and the city of Shanghai through different um, uh, academic disciplines. So I, you know, I, I was starting this project, trying to learn as much as I can uh, through more of an academic um, uh, way of doing things. You know, looking at uh, documents and thinking about theory. Of course, thinking about history. Of course, we are also interacting with living plants. But you know, as as someone who's um, who, who finished PhD in just a year ago. Uh, a year before this, I, you know, I was approaching this more like uh, uh, what people might call um, uh, artistic research. So that, this is actually the first project I started with, uh, working with plants in, um, in my artistic career. And um, then I, through the lecture that um, uh, Tang Weijie gave on the history of Shanghai, and plants. I learned about this book, which was published in 1961 in Shanghai of edible plants. So for people who are familiar with Chinese history, you would know that in 1961, there was a great leap forward. Now it's, it's after the great leap forward. And then we were experiencing huge famine. So different cities in China published these books uh, try to teach people what are the plants, um, wild plants that are edible, that were edible and could, you know, perhaps just save um, save us from um, from dying. So I, I learned about this book through a lecture gave, uh, given by Professor Tom Weijie, and then I decided to copy this book because I think for people who know a bit about Chinese um, cultural practice and during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of books were hand copied. So the book contained, um, if I believe, uh, 64 edible plants. So each will include a picture and um, a textual entry. So I hand copied the book. And then I would, so this is, this is in 2015, I was doing research in Shanghai. And then 2016, I was in Taiwan and I encountered a book, very similar book, published in 1945. Um, again, on edible plants in Taiwan. So it looks like this. Again, it's a very similar format, a picture, a, a drawing and a textual uh, text. Um, you can see the text is actually in Japanese because the book was published in Mar March, 1945 and Taiwan was a Japanese colony at the time. So March, March uh, 1945, the Japanese were preparing to retrieve to the mountains. So they sensed that they might lose the war. So they published this book and thinking about how to survive in the mountains. And also as uh, just one detail I wanna point out, as you can see the, the plant here is a fern. So actually the very first few entries in this edible plant manual were all ferns. But for people who know a bit about um, Taiwan's uh, landscape, you would see a lot of ferns in the forest, but you don't see ferns in cultural representations. You don't see ferns in paintings by Japanese artists in early 20th century, and you also don't see ferns by Taiwanese artists um, throughout the 20th century. So ferns were quite ignored because the Japanese went to Taiwan, they were thinking about tropical flowers. They were attracted, to, uh, they were attracted by the tropical flowers. And um, after 1949, the cities in Taiwan are um, um, sort of landscaped with a lot of plants uh, loved by people who moved to Taiwan from mainland China, like the plum, um, plum trees and flowers loved by uh, Jiang Jieshi. But the local indigenous communities in, in, in Taiwan are 
very familiar with ferns because in the forest in Taiwan, you will see abundant ferns and Taiwan is a hotspot for ferns. So this is my uh, interest in to ferns. This is a book that I copied in Japan. I, I will not talk about this. So I copied this book. I was doing research in Taiwan and I was looking into the history of ferns and Taiwan's political history. And then I realized that um, this kind of practice was, you know, it's, it's highly intellectual. I think it's, you know, for me, it's exciting, but I felt that I didn't really know the plants. I learned a lot about knowledge of plants and perhaps ecological, uh, sense of, uh, ecological knowledge or scientific knowledge, et cetera. But I didn't really have feelings for these plants. So I thought I had to do something. So I, you know, I, I, I also have, um, you know, I also have interest in, uh, in erotic films. I, I did earlier work back in 2005 called Watch Porn, Learn English as a, as a um, sort of a first work on, on uh, erotic film. So I decided to, Okay, so I wanted to get close to the plant, to the plants in, in Taiwan. So I decided to make erotic film between humans and ferns. So this is a this is a project uh, called Turidophilia, which I started in the summer of 2016 while doing residency in Taiwan. This is a still from the, the, the first part of the film I made uh, in 2016. This is a place outside of Taipei. It's actually not in, you know, it's, it's quite accessible. So for people who know Taiwan, you might know, um, you, you actually, you might know this place where you can, you can get tea and there, there's um, um, uh, Kong, which is close to uh, one of the universities. So I was taken there by um, scientists who studies ferns at a national university. And he, this is a place where the scientists collect fern samples. And I, you know, I, I went with him and I was just blown away by the, by the incredible beauty and um, um, experience in this um, forest. As you can see, there are ferns, not only on the ground, but also on the trees. So this is a tropical, forest, you have these epiphytes, uh, plants that, are, that live on, on, on trees or sometimes on canopies. So it's, it's, it's quite a common um, scene in a tropical forest. So I decided to make this film. And um, you know, when I started this project, I didn't know how to describe it to people. And luckily, I met someone who's uh, was a local theater producer, and he knows a lot of the queer um, people in Taipei. So he helped me to ask his friends, and thirteen people came to the casting, and then uh, we chose six. So there are six people who participated in the first part of the film. So you see a pic. So this is from part one, and um, um, the person in, the, in this picture is, is interacting with bird's nest fern, okay, which is a common, um, which is a quite common plant in Taiwan. I also have one here uh, in Hong Kong, in my garden. Okay. So this is the, the first part. And I, you know, I, I didn't know how far I could go with this project. So I just started and it's quite, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit romantic. Um, after making this chapter, I realized there's a lot more I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to spend more time in the forest. I also felt there are ways to interact with these, these plants erotically that I, we haven't explored in part one. So the, in, after a year and a half, I returned to the same forest and, uh, the, this time there's just one performer. Um, 
interacting with the person as firm. Oh, sorry, the caption was wrong, so, so it should be uh, uh, Twitter affiliate too. So he, uh, Jing Yan, who's uh, interacting with the person as firm. And this time we decided to make it much more explicit. So the, 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 the you know, it's, it's full blown sex uh, with, um, with the person as firm. And if you watch this film, as he gets really into it, he, 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 became, he became very passionate and then he started to eat the plant. So there are various reasons that I uh, decided to make this part about sex and eating. I, I'm sure people, uh, it wouldn't be difficult for people to understand, right? So I'm, I'm sure, you know, in our human sexual activity, there's a lot of connection between uh, sex and our um, sort of experience with our mouths and uh, nose, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of connection. I, I'm sure psychologists write about this. And also because I said this plant is, um, is an edible plant. It's, uh, it's called Shansu um, in Taiwan. You go to any uh, Hakka restaurant, um, people will probably suggest this, this, uh, this dish. Um, it's using the young leaves, it's, you just cook the young leaves of the plant, it's, it's very delicious. So everyone in Taiwan knows this is an edible plant. And then so Jing uh, Yan in this film was having sex and also eating the plant. And I, I, you know, I always get asked about ethical issues because the film, if you watch it, is, is really quite passionate. And um, so I, I just want to say that the plant, you know, he, he ate, he devoured part of the plant, but because the, the, the major part of the plant is was uh, not eaten, so it continued to grow. And we returned to this place over and over, and the plant is still there. I'm sure it's still there today. So this is part two. And then part three, I, I decided to try to go one step further, thinking about how to, how to really work with the plants, not only to push our uh, sensory experience and also you know I, I was thinking about what kind of sexual experience we have and um it just happened that i, I have a friend uh, who's a young artist in taiwan and he he practiced sm in his um in, in both his sexual life and also in his uh, in his artistic practice so i learned i went to his workshop and then my other sm um, practitioners so we decided to make chapter three about SM experience with ferns. So this one, um, uh, he, uh, this performer, he, 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 he's, he's a professional um, in bondage. He studied chemistry in Taiwan, didn't graduate and went to Japan to study bondage and now works as a, as a professional practitioner on bondage. So we tried, we experimented with um, large ferns, uh, try to do a bondage experience. And also um, the, this, uh, this person he's into pain. So we found there are actually ferns with uh, thorns. You know, if I didn't do this chapter on SM, I actually never realized there are ferns with uh, very thorny uh, pointers in the forest. I, you know, I just didn't look. So I, I always, you know, and now, you know, I, I realize that what we see is what we want to see. And I think this project allowed me to kind of push and pull in a way that um, we, we look at plants, what are the potential ways to interact with the plants, but also we come in with uh, our human reference, our sexual experience to see what things we could look for in the forest. Um, this is my friend who seemed to, uh, um, kind of torture and sort of performative um, way of torturing. So this is chapter three. And then in chapter four from um, two years ago, uh, we were looking at um, uh, boy love, this comic genre from quite popular in Japan and then also in, in East Asia. Um, first with feminist sort of readers and now it's also a much wider readership. So we were looking at um, boy love comic and thinking about how to actually turn this into an intra-species boy love film. Um, two young, youngish performers working with younger fronds of ferns. But you know, as you can see in this picture, 
the 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 the, the ferns come in such amazing configurations. This is a, a young front that that's waiting to unfold. So this is chapter four, and then chapter five was made for the Liverpool Biennial this year, and thinking about. Um, so I, I wanted to think about spores and um, sperms, looking at sort of a microscopic relationship between plants and us. So focusing on spores. So for people who know plants, to, to who know ferns, you know they they don't produce with uh, flowers; they produce with uh, spores. So this is how we were showing in the Liverpool Biennial this year with uh, five chapters. And uh, Winnie was asking me yesterday, the project hasn't finished. There's one more chapter that I want to make. I'm waiting for the right moment to go back to the same forest. We always go to the same forest. And I think it allows me to really have time, you know, uh, over the past um, five years to to visit the forest repeatedly, to see different plants at different stage of their, life, uh, of their life, and also to experiment with different sexual practice, to engage plants, to engage with ferns in different ways. So this is, th this is one project which allowed me to move beyond just research of course, there's still research involved, but it, it's much more physical, it's much more sensory, um, it's much more about actually our bodily engagement with other beings. Um, second project, I, like, like all of us, um, because of the pandemic, I stopped traveling last year. And finally, you know, I had, I live on I live on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. Um, finally, I was able to to have time to go up the hill to spend time with um, what I call my plant neighbors. Um, I've been wanting to 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 draw the plants here, but I you know I was always tempted to go to different places to to work on a project in Taiwan in Kyoto in. Uh, in Shanghai, et cetera. So finally, because of the pandemic, I was able to stay in where I live and go up the hill every day to draw. So I just started to draw um, the plants um, every day. So I'll do, I'll go up the hill, I draw, I, I will find a place to sit and I will draw, make a drawing and every day is the same routine. And when I started, I was interested also trying to identify the plants to, to know their names. But after a while, I realized it's probably not so important to actually know their names. What's much more important is to just spend time with them. So I, I just, I, I mentioned this picture because uh, in Hong Kong, um, the place, the, 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 the landscape here on Lantau Island is sort of uh, not actually not a forest, you know, the, a lot of the, you know, I think all the big trees were cut down. And so the plants, the, the trees here are only about 40, 50 years old. So there are a lot of vines. And in this picture, you see, I was drawing the vine and I was there for maybe an hour or two hours. And the vine literally turned when I finished, because I was drawing. So I realized the angle has already changed. So sometimes I actually grow pretty fast and then they move, right? So they actually grow pretty fast. So I was, you know, if I just spent enough time, I will actually see them uh, moving. I see their life unfold. Of course, I, most plants don't grow that fast. And so by going up the same path every day, I, was, I, I see how they change. Um, and then I was invited to um, to do a residency at the Grope Spa in Berlin. So I was able to go um, last year from late uh, early August. So for um, so I continued to draw in Berlin. So this is just the street. 
uh, across the street from the Gropius Mall, where the wheat, where there, you know, it's uh, in Berlin, there's still a lot of places like this where wheat grows. So I continue to draw. But I also started to draw trees because there are more trees um, in the city because it's a northern uh, habit, you know, it's a northern climate. So they're actually, so the, the, the habitats are not so entangled. In Hong Kong, there'll be vines and, um, you know, grass and trees. And in Berlin, you know, I, they're just more single, you know, trees would stand out. So I started to draw more trees. Um, I think if I didn't go to Berlin, I, in Hong Kong, I was very much attracted to plants close to the ground because I was sitting. And so um, it's, you know, it's very, of course, it's very obvious that different habitats affect how we experience um, even my posture and how I, how I draw, how I think about aesthetics, et cetera. So we can, we can talk about that um, um, a bit more if there's time. So I've been drawing, you know, I've been, I've been drawing every day uh, since last spring. For me is, you know, again, it's, uh, I think we've talked about this yesterday um, when we were discussing this uh, conversation and, um, you know, she, we've already said, um, you know, it's more about seeing than drawing. It's absolutely what I feel. Drawing is really just a way to keep me there. If I don't draw, I don't see, and I don't spend time with plants because as animals, we're just so used to movement and plants move very slowly. You know, we have very different temporality. So drawing actually, slow, uh, drawing actually slows me down a bit so that I will get a bit closer to their temporality and um, into their experience. So this is how the drawings were shown in Berlin. Um, this past summer. So um, the drawings were organized by Jie Qi, the, the, um, the traditional lunar solar calendar, the 24, uh, the 24, not seasons, the 24 Jie Qi in one calendar. So each table will include one um, set of drawings. And I wanted, I wanted audience to actually sit on the floor kind of like the experience that I was, do, uh, you know, I had drawing these plants. So I, I, I was sitting and I also wanted the drawings to be laid out on a horizontal surface, more like a traditional Chinese scroll. So people will slow down and um, spend more time to see how life unfold, how to see how drawing, um, to feel how life could unfold. So it's very different from a vertical uh, viewing experience. And so the drawings were laid out in over, I think six or seven rooms. And so there's enough space for people to really slow down to walk a bit and then sit down to see drawings and then sort of take in the season. And um, we also subtly changed the lighting of the room. You know, some rooms are completely naturally lit and some with the shades down so to, to, to move people into the winter in Berlin. Um, and I also made a film in Berlin thinking about the politics of the forest, but I, I, I realize I'm short of time, so I will, I will not talk about this project. Um, I will jump into the last one. Um, so this is a film, you know, I'll just say this is a film I made in a forest outside of Berlin thinking about the politics of the forest. It's also, I think we were working on site to think. I, I often, now I realize I, you know, in order to understand the forest, to think about the politics of the forest, we have to be in the forest. We can't just sit at home to think. Just the last part, you know, I'll, I'll finish because this is actually, the, the project is called Eco-Sensibility Exercise, which is the title of what I want to talk about today. So for people who have been to the Gropius Valley in Berlin, um, you know, there's, there's you, you probably know the, the institution as a building. But actually, if you go to the roof of the building, you look down, you see these trees. Um, I had a studio on the top floor of Gropius Bow. So when I look out of my window of the studio, I see these trees. 
and it literally looks like a small forest. So this is from the area of view, but if you go down to the, uh, to the ground level, you realize it's been used as a parking lot. Of course, this is taken, the, this picture was taken in winter, so the leaves have fallen. But even in summer, for people who go to the Pogorka as well, I'm sure you probably never spent time there because it's been, it has been um, used as a parking lot. And so for most people who visit the art place, the art institution, they just go into the building and leave the building and see what the see what's uh, on view inside the building. And I, I just thought it's such a, it's such a pity because the trees are so visible uh, if you just spend time there. And um, it's part of the it's part of the group is found, but it wasn't in the thinking of the art institution. So we decided to take over part of the parking lot and build this temporary platform this summer. And um, so you see the trees. Um, and so the, the parking lot is actually huge. So we only took, we took over 10% of the parking lot to build this platform. And to bring people, to bring visitors to this um, place to spend time with the trees, I designed what I start to call eco-sensibility exercises. So this one is based on traditional Qigong practice. I actually learned um, a bit of Qigong from one of Winnie's students, parents uh, who are Qigong masters in Hong Kong. So for people who know a bit about Qigong, there's a traditional practice called collecting the energy, the qi of trees. So I learned a little bit of this practice and interpret it in a way to incorporate my understanding of trees and turn this into a daily practice during the exhibition this summer. So people who can see the drawing, see the film, and then they can come out and join me every afternoon for eco-sensibility exercise. And you know, every afternoon except Tuesday when the museum was closed, I was there for three hours leading this exercise and also drawing exercise to bring people to these trees and also to interact with the trees from uh, sort of the energy perspective. I think there's a lot of potential on thinking about intra-species relations uh, through these traditional practice. So I will stop here and I look forward to uh, discussion. Hello, hello. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, Bo, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Um, I first met you a few years ago when you when you lectured for my students on a study trip to Hong Kong, and I can see how much has developed since the terrestrophilia uh, that we that we you you talked about a little bit at that time, and and actually I do have uh, a couple of questions for you, and also at this point I want to encourage. Uh, uh, everyone to put your questions in the chat um for Bo. but but the immediate one i want to talk about is is actually the notion of materiality and i i guess materiality is a, is a bit of a a key word at the moment it's it's certainly in in academic um discourse over the last few years and i think you know particularly since the uh white chapel show you know in in uh, 2015 and I wanted to ask, did you, you know, everything you've talked about, so that, that bodily interaction with plants, that bringing of the senses together, that engagement, in terms of materiality, as Petra Langer Burnt wrote in, in, in her introduction to, to the book Materiality uh, from, the, from the Whitechapel show, she, she talked about how in, getting inside if you like inside other materials rather than it being a formal quality that that sense of co-joining and, and, and almost like the the adjectives that you might discuss to to describe how you feel your interaction is that that sense of the phenomenon did you at any point deliberately invoke that theoretical framework of materiality to your work or did it did it come purely from avenues of that philosophical query about our interconnectedness with other species and this and this surprise that you described on seeing this this patch of, of uh, 
of Shanghai that was inhabited by this mix of, of plants. I haven't um, spent much time thinking about materiality because I, you can see that I, you know, I don't, I don't keep a studio. Um, I always say the the hill is is um, is my studio, and so I work with very simple materials like you know a piece of paper and, um, but I think perhaps the line between uh, the bodies of plants and what you say about what you describe about materiality there's actually a lot of linkage i think it's this idea of getting into like what you said about getting into the um the, the material experience sort of inside the material i think to me it's about this experience of um getting very close to plants and sometimes perhaps in you know the the film you know the in into the plants where the plants are in um in us so this 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 desire this desire to actually get very close and almost um in you know uh, almost inside but certainly entangled mm. um is i think to me is it's very resonant what you mm -hmm. just said. I mean that that because bodily that, yeah that with the bodily sensation particularly there. Sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. You know that that closeness between the consumption of the plant, this edible plant in Taiwan mm -hmm. that's in restaurants mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, the idea of consumption and the consumption uh, of, if you like, the more erotic, the the bodily, the the the, the thing that we all have the urge towards of of. Um, mm -hmm co-joining and, and ultimately reproduction. I mean, that, that is a sort of, that, that circularity um, I thought was particularly striking there, consumption and consumption. I think also this, um, the, 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 because I was running out of time, so I was, I, I was talking very briefly about this um, Qigong practice. So the traditional understanding of beings is not just the material what what the, the sort of modern scientific might uh, i would say the modern scientific understanding of materiality it's also is it's the uh, the t a better translation is uh, energy matter energy so it's both matter and energy so there's a lot of similarity to quantum uh, physics so i would think about you know if i were thinking about the materiality i would think about maybe expanding this um, notion to towards matter energy and i think there's a lot of um sort of indigenous or traditional wisdom in understanding not only ourselves but other beings as matter and energy and how do we how do we expand Experience their not only their materiality but also their energy. Um, you know, either we call life or or vibrancy. Um, that's also I think that's also what I'm um, thinking about. Yes, I I mean you mentioned the science of it, um, and this is the last part of my question before we move to mm -hmm. questions from the chat. And it takes me back, and this is with my history hat on. It takes me back to the late nineteenth century where. Um, lens technology, for example, had allowed scientists to really look at the, the structure of cells. And if you think of um, artists like an artist and scientists like uh, Ernst Haeckel, who made art forms from nature, the Kunstform der Natur, and you know art and nature being in interchangeable, and the way that that idea of matter being shared you know you have a cellulose based cell this is you know basic biology for kids at school now but you have the cellulose type cell and you have the the proteinous cell of of uh, you know animals and mammals and so on and essentially it's all the same it's it's, it's going right down and you know obviously that's had a long narrative in um modern contemporary art and did you know did you did you have any sense of being part of that historic motion towards 
understanding the world and not, not just in scientific terms, as you've said, but the chi and this, this sense of the energy of, of the matter. So the project, the drawing project is called Drawing of Life. Um, so in Chinese is xie uh, sheng, which is similar to life drawing. So it's the same word in Chinese. I think in English, it, you know, I, I make it very explicit. So I'm not just drawing a dead plant. I'm drawing a living plant. I'm drawing the life of plants. I did an earlier project where I drew uh, roots of weeds in Shanghai. So I had to pull the plant out to draw the roots and then pull the plant back. And of course it, it you know, some plants will die. So I realized that it's very brutal practice. So the, the, the process of drawing involves pulling the plants out of the soil. So I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'll try to, I try to answer in a, in a, in a sort of a, short way the the edible manuals i copied in 19 you know the the, the three books i showed from 1960 to 1945 so the drawings were influenced by modern scientific botanical drawings mm -hmm. so they look very much like anatomical drawings of plants with roots but all these books actually were modeled on a ming dynasty book from 1409 so if you look at that book the artists were drawing living plants so you wouldn't see roots unless the roots were the edible parts. So I think the there's you know I, I you know it, it, I'm sure art historians have a lot to say about different drawing uh, traditions and uh, different eras too. I you know I don't know how um, how say uh, eighth century artists or someone drawing plants uh, may have very different um, paradigm. Um, which, you know, for me, like I said, you know, drawing the life quality, drawing the lifeness and vibrancy is much more important than drawing anatomical um, uh, understandings of plants. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Bo, thanks, Viv. I, I think mm -hmm. at this point, maybe we can turn to some of the questions from the audience. And um, I'm just reading a very interesting one, I think that, uh, you know, it's quite, it's a, it's a question I think that comes to mind, especially when thinking about the kind of, um, you know, the kind of uh, sexualization or eroticization of the ferns, especially in that video, which is, you know, arguably a provocative work. Um, and so this question from Esme uh, Garlic, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, um, I think really frames some of the kind of uh, the issues to do with the power dynamics, perhaps, uh, in that piece. Uh, and the question is, how do you think that art which works so closely with plants can tread the line between appreciation and exploitation, arguably using plants like this, primarily for human engagement, erotic, social, intellectual, could reinforce dynamics of human exploitation of the natural world? Um, which I think is a great question. I mean, it does, you know, your, a lot of your work also references kind of colonial botany and the history of that kind of exploitation. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment a little bit about, about this, this piece in particular and, mm -hmm. and uh, Esme's question. I, a few things, you know, I, I don't think I will be, be able to answer this question directly. Um, a few things. One is um, the calibration of ethics is quite situational. So whether we are doing a film in the forest uh, with a very small number of people and we go back after a year so we don't destroy the place versus say a large film crew who go to a forest and set up all the infrastructure is, I would imagine, you know, I, I hope this makes it very different. But by doing anything, we are uh, impacting that place. You know, if we don't go, if we don't make the film um, without human um, presence, there's perhaps 
um, a very different situation. I think there's also a lot of you know a lot of scientific research on both uh, Native American communities living with forests who actually increase biodiversity um, by being there. I mean, you know, I'm just citing one. There are many examples. For example, also herding in uh, in Africa, etc. So we, you know, I acknowledge we we have impact. But I don't think the human presence is necessarily always a negative impact. And also, I I say this very you know it's very situational. It's it's also about eco you know it kind of goes back to the top of the title of the talk. So it's eco sensibility. It's often you know these these sort of ethical decisions need to be made when we have the patience to sense the ecological situation, to develop our eco sensibility so that we know where the line is rather than treating it in a very short um, moment. And also just, you know, just say, I, I also, I often bring up this um, sentence from Dao Te Ching, the foundational uh, Taoism text so there's one line I really like. Um, so Lao Tzu, the, the, the supposedly the author of the text says, actually when we lose Tao, we start to think about ethics. And when we lose ethics, we start to, um, no, when we lose Tao, we start to think about focus. And when we, when we lose focus, we start to think about uh, um, commitment. And when we lose commitment, we start to think about uh, ethics. And then when we lose ethics, we start to think about ritual. So I'm thinking a lot about um, uh, Taoist sensibility um, these days, because I actually feel it's something perhaps even beyond um, eco ethics, which is a huge topic, I think, in contemporary both um, aesthetics and also a large, you know, in, in activism. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fascinating. I think the, the kind of Taoist approach and angle is really interesting and, you know, in a sense relates to this connection to orality and, you know, cycles and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I wonder if Esme, and Esme, if you're still here and listening, please feel free mm -hmm. to add more comments to the chat, to the chat uh, uh, mm -hmm. regarding your previous question. Um, but I wonder if, you know, this idea of, um, you know, connecting it back to a sense of hum the human, you know, the kind of a human imposition, as it were, um, is very much to do with the quite graphic representation of desire, you know, in that in that in those mm -hmm. films, right? So, I mean, they are, you know, they are very sexualized, you know, there, it is, um, in a sense, you know, it's, a, there is a kind of, uh, an appetite, you know, what I mean, it's a kind of human mm -hmm. uh, sexual appetite, a desire mm -hmm. that's being acted out. And the way that mm -hmm. it's filmed as well is just so mm -hmm. luscious and beautiful and sensual. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if that doesn't, in a way, draw the focus, in fact, back to the human rather than, um, you know, to to towards a kind of vegetal ontology. I mean, I know that you, you've had conversations, a lot of conversations with philosophers mm -hmm. like Michael Marder, you know, think about like vegetal thinking and what that might mean mm -hmm. and how that may be different from a, from a, from an anthropocentric perspective. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, I mean, so, but, but, you know, at the same time, I, you know, I think that the films are so fascinating because I always, I wondered initially, you know, is this also a kind of, you know, I think the clue may be in the title there, you know, where it's about mm -hmm. a kind of fetish, right? It's a kind of fetish, mm -hmm. like fetishization as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few things, you know, like uh, eclectic, you know, one is there is um, the idea of biophilia, uh, the E.O. Wilson idea, right? So that's in the title. Um, and two, this idea of uh, desire and pleasure and joy through um, our sexual uh, relations is very much present. You know, I, in, in Yokohama where I show this work, I actually show uh, uh, footage from nature documentary showing bees humping orchids. So mm -hmm. this interspecies desire and sexuality actually exists in nature um, 
between certain bees and orchids. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the term, the scientific term is called pseudo copulation. So I'm also thinking about um, not only desire, I'm thinking about co-evolution. So if, you know, the, the film is, a, is sort of an artistic provocation, a chance encounter, but if we continue to do this over the next, you know, several million years, we will actually evolve as beings. You know, I'm not joking. You know, if we continue to evolve, we actually will, um, you know, as a, a you know, it, it becomes part of our DNA. Uh, not only just um, just just uh, just artistic um, performance, and also lastly, I think um, you know the 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 new film in Berlin is just the forest, no humans. But you you is I actually think it's very challenging for contemporary viewers because we you know. I, you know, you know, dare I say, I spend more time with plants, so I see plants, you know, I have a sensibility. So that, going back to the, to the, so I think we are in this process where we are learning to become more sensitive to other beings. And often one route to be um, sensitive to other beings is through a human plant or human animal interaction. And you mentioned uh, Michael Martyr, you know, Natasha Meyer, uh, who's an artist and writer in Toronto, she talks about visualizing our sensorium. So the projects I talk about, you know, I'm trying to train myself to be sensitive to plants. So I don't always think about humans first. So mm -hmm. when I walk in Hong Kong, I, you know, my partner is here. So we always, we always try to focus on plants rather than people on the street. Mm -hmm. and so, so I think it takes a lot of practice and training. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, yeah, I think of course, I hope, you know, I hope, you know, of course, I hope more and more people will start uh, training ourselves. Yeah. Well, this leads us to, to another question, another comment by Brandon, um, who says it's beautiful work. Uh, during your work, did you observe uh, or document any physical and mental well-being benefits of drawing, observing uh, and, and being within nature? No, I don't document that. Um, I think, it, it, you know, I, I, I often think science these days is proving things that we already know. Uh, we, I always, you know, I, of course I respect scientists. I talk to scientists and learn a lot from scientists, but I also think collective as a society, we should actually spend more time doing eco-sensibility eco exercises running, rather than just reading research uh, findings, which already, you know, prove things where to know. So I always, I actually think it's really important that we, we start to train ourselves to do things rather than just sit and read and learn these things, learn these insights. Actually, yeah, if I might uh, just uh, ask one thing, if, if you don't mind, uh, with that, when you, when you talked about um, that, that you slow, slowing down in order to be able to draw because of enforced lockdown and it made you slow down it made you go to mm -hmm. what was on your doorstep rather than to taiwan or further afield mm -hmm. and also the way that uh, the audience the viewers were were invited to consume the art by kneeling down and sitting looking at lowing mm -hmm. low down and it made me think of that that sort of um well-known uh discussion of this by Merleau-Ponty when he talked mm -hmm. about drawing in itself the act of drawing is it is a slowing down of everything mm -hmm. you notice you notice everything that's going on obviously he saw Matisse a slow down film of Matisse mm -hmm. drawing and that sense of time slowing down because you're in that moment you're in that moment mm -hmm. of of absolute concentration in what you're doing and again that that sense of slowing down is that something that you have to do, not only in order to be able to draw, but in order to be able to walk through the street with your partner and notice the plants rather than thinking about what's going on with what you're planning to do or noticing what a person is doing? Do you think it requires that same um, discipline? I wouldn't say discipline. I would say it's, it's a joy, right? So. Um, of course, I also want to say, you know, I'm hugely privileged to live in a village, uh, to have the privilege to slow down. Um, you know, I think it's such, you know, it's such a privilege, 
in 2021 to, to live a slow life. Um, I would just say, I think it's also, for me, it's also very important to do daily practice. And I think for anyone who, you know, I always say, for me, you know, ha still having exhibitions is not to just for people to come see what I do. I really hope the, the, um, the exhibition become uh, impetus for people to do something in their own lives, right? So if they see these drawings, they, you know, if they, if they can start to draw, I always say it doesn't matter whether you are good at drawing or not. You know, it's really just spend time with plants to slow down, to enjoy the plants, to have a moment of silence um, to the degree possible in our lives. And then, you know, I think, I, I you know, I kind of believe in gradual enlightenment. So I always think, you know, gradually we'll move towards what we uh, want to get to. Thank you. Well, that's a really, really beautiful answer. I think also, well, maybe before we, we're going to have to end uh, shortly, but there are so many questions. I think your work is so rich and uh, there's so many aspects of it we couldn't quite touch on um, uh, today, but maybe you, you could end by telling us a little bit about the Wan Wu Sha, you know, so the, 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 the Wan Wu Council that you that you uh, lead in, in, in the university and some of the, uh, the ideas behind that. Um. So the, the research group here um, at the university where I teach is called uh, One Will Practice Group. So I have seven PhD students. So we are working on very different topics um, from uh, you know, human silkworm relationship to uh, edible menus from Ming Dynasty to artists working with um, uh, yeast. And so we were a mixed group of people doing research and art. And um, I think we're really in, um, um, you know, in a learning stage. And the term Wang Wu for people who don't know Chinese is the Taoist term of 10,000 beings. And I think now we have, you know, eight of us and we're looking at, you know, plants and yeast, et cetera. So we're no, nowhere near the 10,000 beings um, 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 ideal. But I also, you know, I think we not only do art and research, we also try to put these things into our practice, into our daily lives. And I really believe this is something that as artists and academics, we, um, we, we are moving into. Thank you both. So we've we've had a few um, questions come in, and I think if it's okay with everybody, we can actually go on a little a little bit longer. If that's fine with you, um, Bo. Uh, so yeah. we've had a few comments. One of them uh, from Virginia. I wondered if uh, Bo. This is a suggestion. Bo, would you consider mm -hmm. copying the plant book out on edible paper as part of the food themed interaction, uh, and then film that being eaten as reference to man and to nature? So that was a kind of that's a kind of <laughs> a suggestion for future practice. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think I'll do it, but go <laughs> ahead. I think you know you should do it. <laughs> 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 it's a great it's a great idea yes mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good idea um and then we've got a, a couple more more comments on the font on the on the uh, fern work so uh from salen i find it interesting to bring the topic of ferns uh, sexuality ferns can be male female hermaphroditic they actually uh decide on the sex based on their environment to balance the ratio uh, older ones deciding on the assignment in some cases, they stay asexual, even and reproduce asexually. Do you think this fluidity and observations in ferns, uh, the, the fluidity of that kind of sexuality, I think, um, cycles back to your work and can be can be furthered? Yes, of course. Um, I think, it, you know, I, 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 I often say people describe the film as equal queer, and I always say it's about the queerness of the plants, like you. Mm -hmm like what, what, you, what uh, this uh, audience just uh, elucidated. You know, the, the sexuality of ferns are very, very complex and different from angiosperm from flowering plants. But I think even for flowering plants, the sexuality is much more um, uh, diverse and complex than what we would think of as sort of heteronormal um, sexuality. Absolutely. So from Colette, mm -hmm. uh, I, I love your idea that the practice uh, of eco-sensibility exercises as a way for humans to, uh, maybe a way for humans to grow, or in fact even evolve. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts about how to make such a practice more widespread or even 
mainstream. The idea of mindfulness has become so popular, but sensitivity mm. to flora and fauna is different and really important. I don't know how to make it more widespread. I think as an artist, I'm just very used to doing something um, experimental. And um, I think if someone wants to start something more for the larger society, please go ahead. Yeah. It reminded me, I, I, as soon as I saw the images from the sessions that you were running, um, mm -hmm. it, it reminded me of what um, drama students do when they're training, you know, trying to think mm -hmm. from the inside, what is it like to be a tree in these positions? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, mm -hmm. yoga, I mean, you, which, which does that uh, mm -hmm. all, all the time is you're, you're thinking mm -hmm. in, in different terminology. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, but it, you know, I'm, joking aside, it, actually, it very much is about thinking from the position of something that you can only perceive, therefore you can only imagine uh, what it is like to be that life form. And, and, and that's as close as you can get. But I mean, that, that mm -hmm. the time taken, you mentioned that you were there for three hours in the afternoons mm -hmm. to hold these sessions um, and pe people would be able to join in as they chose. Um, did you actually do that documentation of your work? Of course, this is this is an extension of the whole practice. Mm -hmm. How much did those participants know about what you were doing as part of your practice, as opposed to something that was an interactive public um, performance? Yeah, so I, 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 for me, it's very important to call them exercise rather than workshop or performance. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's what I did last year during residency and also this time during exhibition. And I also always say, uh, I'm not, you know, you're just exercising with me. You know, I, I'm also quite new to this. So we're just doing the exercise together. Um, and I also think that, you know, it, the other beings, you know, the plants, they're just so, they're so powerful. You know, by by standing under the tree, everything becomes much easier than doing it not with a tree, you know, the, the, the Qigong practice. So there is something, you know, I am working with a plant to do the to do the exercise um, there with the public. So it's not just me, it's also that tree um, sort of leading the practice. And um, and I also I, I, you know, th this is not kind of answer, but I, and I, you know, I always say. These things are not difficult. What's difficult is, you know, we, we just do a little bit of every day. Um, like many cultures, many practices, you know, many traditions, many practices have these uh, exercises or wisdoms. And, you know, once we learn a little bit, we should just start doing it. And, you know, the, it, it, you know again, it's, it's not about learning a lot. It's about learn a little bit and then start doing and then learn a bit more and then do a bit more. Yeah. Thank you, Bo. On that note, I think we can uh, wrap things up for today. And thank you uh, so much for this really fascinating lecture. And, um, and I'd also like to, and thank you, Viv, as well. And I'd like to also thank uh, Stefan Lowenthal again, of course, for his support of LACA and um, uh, for, for us uh, in, in uh, being able to put together this, this wonderful event. Um, Viv, do you have any last words would you like to uh, add? Uh, well, exactly what you've just said, Wenny, thank you. And, uh, and Bo, I, I'm glad that um, after initially discussing the possibility of, of uh, coming, or in this case, virtually coming to the UK to give a talk, um, about your work um, four years ago. I'm, I'm glad it's finally come to fruition through LACA and through the, um, the hugely appreciated um, cooperation with the Courtauld and the Courtauld for ho hosting uh, this wonderful talk and sort of opening it out to uh, the many people who enjoy the Courtauld's courses and uh, public lectures. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, folks. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye.